King David says this in uh, God's word in Psalm 18. He says, he says, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, my mountain where I seek refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I was saved from my enemies. The ropes of death were wrapped around me. Torrents of destruction terrified me. The ropes of hell entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. But I called to the Lord in my distress, and I cried to my God for help. And from his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Would you stand as we continue to worship today?
so it's good to be back. And uh, it's just, you know, I mean, going to a, a, a new church or a different church, is, it takes a while to get comfortable, doesn't it? And I feel like I haven't worshipped God like on Sunday, you know, with the body since, since, I, since the second Sunday in February. It's the last time I was here. Um, it's just, you know, it's just not the same. When, when you're not with your body. Uh, that's the way I feel about it anyway. And, um, so it's good to be back. Uh, I, we have some new faces, and I'm so glad to, to see you. Um, it, it, I'd love to, to, to say hello right over here and, and just spend some more time getting acquainted uh, at the information table after the service. Uh, what else? You guys did a fantastic job. Um, did, did Chris and, and Jeff and Don and Caleb, huh? Good job. I knew they would. I knew you guys would be fine without me. Um, I just hope that, that the new folks that are coming, you guys keep coming after you've heard me. And that means see me. Uh, hope, hope to do that. Uh, what did I do while I was gone? Um, well, I spent a lot of time with God. I guess before I get to say that, let me just say thank you. Um, it was time that that uh, that I needed as the pastor of this church to kind of get out and, and be able to look at and pray about and kind of over the whole thing, you know, as, as, as the pastor, the lead pastor of Meeting House Church, got to get out sometimes and look around. Uh, I needed it uh, for my personal relationship with God. My wife, believe it or not, has said that I have actually begun to, or the, I should say the Holy Spirit has actually begun to produce the fruit of the Spirit in me. Um, love, joy, peace. I know it's hard to believe, patience, kindness, but, but it's actually happening. Uh, so that's good. Um, spent, a, spent a week uh, on a personal retreat with nobody um, except me and, and God and God's Word and the Holy Spirit, you know. Uh, just reading, read all, most of the Bible, took, took, took notes on most of the Bible. Uh, and... Uh, Daily sought God's direction for Meeting House Church. Most days were a couple, few hours, not more than a couple, few hours spent in, in prayer and, and, and Bible study, either uh, seeking direction for, for Meeting House Church and, and study as well. Of course, that's something that we as a leadership team, our pastoral staff, has been praying about since uh, November. And then I think God is really uh, starting to develop something. Uh, and, and I look forward to that and a few more vision meetings. Um, so, so I spent a lot of time uh, that doing that. Uh, I understand the vision meetings uh, just went well. A lot of good uh, give and take and, and, and input, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna have at least a couple more of those. Okay, we had a pretty good turnout. I guess we had about we had about 30 people there, about a third of our you know 30 percent of our congregation. Uh, so that's good, um, but that's not enough. I'd like to see 100 percent there. Um, why? Because this is your church. And, and, and the scriptures say that as a body, we need to be united in spirit, in mind, and purpose. Okay? Spirit, mind, and purpose. You know, we need to love one another in spirit. You know, in mind, we need, to, we need to be thinking the same things, have the same ideas about what we're doing in purpose. We're all headed in the same direction. And, and this is the way, these vision meetings are ways that you can have input into this. And, and work through it because when, when uh, you know, we feel like God is really kind of clarifying, uh, it's not crystal clear yet, but clarifying a, uh, the way forward for us. And, and I want you to be a part of that. So you are invited to these vision meetings, okay? And we'll let you know when the next ones are. I guess that covers it. Oh, I did visit our, I visited our church plants, and they are three church plants, Discovery Church up in, up in Weymouth. Uh, doing well. Um, uh, Redemption Fellowship in Fall River, doing very well. <coughs> and our newest, uh, started January 25th, um, Refuge Church uh, down in, uh, I guess they're going to end up in Warren, Rhode Island, uh, is where they're going to end up. Kyle and the gang, they're doing well. Uh, and so it was a joy to get to go and, and worship with them and, and meet with the guys. And uh, So that was good. Good. And all that is because, all that work, because you guys uh, gave me the opportunity to do that. So thank you. Um, today we are celebrating, as I said, the Lord's 
Supper, uh, communion. And uh, this is the way that Jesus told us to remember or proclaim his death until he returns. Right? You know Jesus is coming back. He's going to come. He's coming back. Um, and, and boy, I, amen. Yes. I can't wait for that day. He's coming back. Uh, we're going to see him again. He's going to set up uh, his kingdom um, of, of love and righteousness and, 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 and reign on this earth. Um, and all the nonsense is going to be gone. But until that time, he said uh, that he wanted us to remember his death on the cross for us by a simple and powerful uh, ceremony. To eat a piece of bread and to drink a cup. And that bread and, and, and that cup uh, represent his body and blood, which he gave, right? He gave his life for you and for me so that we can have new life. So we're going we're gonna to do that at the end of the service today. But before we get there or to, to get us to that point, we're going to be in John chapter 12 today, which is, which is the Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem six days before he was crucified. So that's today, right? Today is the day of Jesus' triumphal entry, also known as Palm Sunday, right? Why is it called Palm Sunday? Well, because when Jesus came into Jerusalem on this particular time, this was the only time it happened. It was the last time that he entered Jerusalem. He stayed there um, and then was crucified, uh, well, at least the last time until after he rose from the dead. Uh, 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 he, he, it was Palm Sunday because as he came in, the people were shouting and praising him as their king, and they waved palm branches, and they put them on the road in front of him as he came in uh, to the city. And thus it's called Jesus' Triumphal Entry or, or Palm Sunday. Uh, so let's look at John chapter 12. Um, and we're just going to let these, these verses from verse 12 to, uh, I don't know, verse I can't, 36 or so, uh, just tell us who Jesus is. Let this scene tell us what he's done for us, okay? Um, John chapter 12, uh, verse 12 says, the next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast, that's the feast of Passover, so there's a great crowd in Jerusalem. you got people from all over the Mediterranean world, Jews from all over the Mediterranean world, non-Jews who believe in you know, the one true God uh, in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast. Uh, all of them, just so the city is crowded. And they heard this crowd that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And they took palm branches, right? Palm Sunday. And went out to meet him. Shouting, Hosanna! Now, if you don't know what Hosanna means, it means save now. Hosanna, save now, King Jesus. So they see Jesus is coming into the city. He is the king that's going to save them. from. But they have a, a, a kind of a different saving agenda in mind. They're thinking political, they're thinking economic. Jesus is going to deliver us from the oppression of this government, of, of Rome, of, of all the injustice that's being done. And certainly Jesus is, and God does deliver from, from injustice and, and, and oppression. Uh, and so they're saying, save now, Jesus. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey fulfilling prophecy from, from Zechariah hundreds of years prior. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it. As it is written, do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And that is who, folks, we need to focus on today and every day of our lives is King Jesus. King Jesus. I want you to know this and, and, and that, that Jesus is our Savior. He is the one who rescues us, right? From, from, from penalty of our sin, from, from, from hardships, from difficulties, from, from all kinds of things. Jesus is our, our Savior, our Rescuer. But I want you to know that Jesus is also King. He is 
king over everything. The scriptures say that God has put all things under his feet. He rules the nations. Jesus is king of the universe. He's king of the earth. He's king of nations. They rise and fall, God's word says, because of his work in them. But also, folks, Jesus is king in your life. He's king. He rules. He deserves, right, uh, 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 submission and, and worship and honor and praise. He's our king. Jesus is king. And I, you need to get this picture because, because uh, it, it, the whole city, okay, is out to meet Jesus. To understand this really truly, you have to think of something like the Super Bowl. You know, the Patriots win the Super Bowl and they're downtown on the duck boats. Okay, that's the picture you got. The Red Sox have just won the World Series and, and the duck boats are out and people are lining the streets. That's the kind of picture you got to get. It's very self. They are just, the people are psyched, man. Our king is here. Right? He's going to save us right now. He's the king who blesses. It's a party. Why are they so excited? Well, one reason that, that, the, that the chapter tells us is that, <clears throat> uh, is that he had healed Lazarus, his friend. Actually raised him from the dead, right? Lazarus had been dead a number of days. Jesus raised him back to life. And some of the people who were there at Lazarus' house in Bethany were at Jerusalem, okay? And that news had spread. And, and, and most of the people in Jerusalem had already seen Jesus do miracles, right? He'd been ministering in Jerusalem, in and out of Jerusalem for, for three years, healing the sick, right? Uh, uh, healing the lame. Uh, making the blind see. And so, so, so the crowd is just in a, in a fervor for Jesus. And that's the kind, folks, blessing. <coughs> so the first thing I want us to, to think about today from this passage is that Jesus is the king who blesses us. Okay? That is why the crowd is so fired up. Because it's the, Jesus, this king who can raise the dead, this king who can, who can heal blind eyes, right? Open deaf ears, uh, strengthen and straighten uh, handicapped legs. This Jesus who can bless is king. Okay? Jesus is the king who blesses us. you got to get that picture. But in six days... The crowd is not going to be shouting Hosanna, right? Save now. They're going to be shouting something else, right? <laughs> Crucify him. Crucify him. We don't want this man to be king over us. So something happens between this day and, and, and Friday that changes their mind. I mean, they want Jesus the king who blesses. And let me, and let me just affirm this because... Jesus is the king who blesses you. The scriptures say that because you are a believer in Jesus Christ, okay, um, God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing that he has to give. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms belongs to you in Christ. The Bible says that God has provided because Jesus is your king, God has given you everything you need for life and godliness. There is nothing uh, that you will face in this life that if you go to King Jesus and seek his resources and his strength, that he will not walk with you, strengthen you, comfort you, and will bring you through. Okay? Jesus is the king who blesses you. He blesses you with the promise of God. Uh, first, or Second Peter says that you and I are partakers of the divine nature. We, we are filled with the Holy Spirit and, and, we, and we get to know God and draw our strength and life from Him through His very great and precious promises. Jesus is the one who makes those promises your promises and my promises. 
Okay? Jesus has just recently answered prayer for me and my family. We have a prayer journal. You hear me talk about this all the time because you ought to keep a prayer journal because you ought to trust God to answer your prayers. And, and we write our prayers on the top of the page and we leave the bottom half of the page for the answer. And can I tell you that over the last couple of months, God has, has specifically, quickly, clearly, graciously, uh, generously answered three of our family's prayers. Boom! I mean, I couldn't believe it. It was like the ink wasn't even wet on the prayer. And it's like, wow, we already got some answers to write in here. You know? God wants, God is a blesser. Jesus is the king who blesses you. Folks, there's, there's people in our church that, that Jesus has healed from addiction, that he's freed from, from new age and, 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 and cultic religious practices and and. and, and there's marriages that he has healed. Jesus is the king who blesses you. I'm not sure you believe that. You don't look like you really believe that Jesus is the king who blesses you. Am I not preaching this well? <laughs> Am I not communicating here? I mean, but here's the truth, folks. And, and I, I, everybody's experienced this. Sometimes we have a hard time believing that Jesus is the king who wants to bless, don't we? You ever been there? That's a tough place to be. And sometimes some, of, some Christians, they just have a particularly difficult time believing that, man, God loves them and, and he sent this king Jesus uh, to, to just bless them, just to pour out God's goodness and love. You know, read Ephesians chapter 2. You know why God, it says in Ephesians chapter 2 that, that God has, the, let me just read it to you. Because uh, um, this is fantastic and you, it's amazing. God, folks, you cannot believe how generous, how loving, how good God wants to be to you. Um, Ephesians chapter 2. Why? God saved you. Why he poured out his grace on you. Ephesians chapter 2, um, verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Right? So God is in some real spiritual crazy way that you and I can't really fathom right now. God has, has, has not only given us spiritual life, but He's seated you with Christ in the heavenlies. So God is on His throne, Jesus is at His right hand, and you and I are at Jesus' right hand. Got me? Okay? Now, that's not, it gets better if you can believe that. Uh, verse, uh, it sent us in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Verse 7. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Why did Jesus uh, give you new life and, and seat you at God's right hand? So that in the coming ages he just might just lavish his grace upon you even more and more. That's what it says. Why did God bless you in that way? So he could in forever bless you even more. Folks, Jesus is the king who blesses. You need to believe that. You need to trust that. You need to see him as a God, as Savior, as king who loves you and just wants to pour out his goodness on you. And, and some of us have difficulty with that. The crowd today that on this day didn't have that problem, did they? They wanted Jesus, the king who blesses. Come and reign over us, man. Who, I, right? There, that's a good thing. And Jesus is that. But then Jesus reveals some more about himself that the crowd just wasn't so excited about. That he's not just the king who's blessed, who blesses. He's also a different kind of king. And let's, let's pick that up. Back to the story. So Jesus is riding in on the donkey, uh, palm branches, people lining the street, his apostles, you know, kind of trailing on either side of him. 
And, uh, and it's, you know, it's a festival, you know, it's a, it's a party. And people want to get close to Jesus. They want to talk to Jesus. As a matter of fact, some Greeks, it says, get up the courage. You know, hey man, let's go talk to him, you know. Let's ask this guy. He's close to us, you know. And it's Philip. Philip's walking along, you know, and, and so some Greeks come up to Philip. They say, hey, would, we want to see Jesus. Will you, will you introduce us to Jesus? And so verse 20, now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast, and they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. They want to talk to Jesus. They want, they want to be close to him. And so Philip, he goes and, and tells Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip, you know, takes the Greeks with them, and, and they go to Jesus, okay? Okay. And Jesus tells them, Jesus lets them in on, on a truth about the, another kind of king that he is. Okay? And that's really what the remainder of our is going to be that discussion, that, that, that revelation that Jesus gives to Peter and Andrew and, and the Greeks. And, and let's look at it in verse 23. Jesus replies, so they come to, hey, we want to see Jesus. We want, to, we want to talk to Jesus. And Jesus reveals himself in these words to these Greeks. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. In other words, the hour has come, Jesus says, it's time for me to die on the cross and, and to rise from the grave. That's what Jesus means uh, by, by to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies... It remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. But see, folks, nobody, this, Peter, I mean, uh, uh, Philip and Andrew weren't expecting this, although Jesus had been trying to pound it into their heads for a little bit. The Greeks weren't expecting this. Greek believers were not expecting to hear this. What? A king who's going to die? That doesn't make sense. But Jesus tells us, he says, look, if, if I die, right? He's saying, if I die, then I'm going to produce many seeds, right? Many seeds. Right now, it's estimated that one third of the earth's population are believers in Jesus Christ. Many, many seeds. Christianity is growing in China in South Korea, in uh, Nepal. Right now, Christianity is growing in Nepal faster than the, than the population is growing. You know, so if you extrapolated that out, at some point, everybody in, 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 in Nepal are, would be a Christian who is alive. Probably won't happen, but that's how fast it's growing. Many seeds. Many seeds. Jesus is the king who died to give you life with God, now and forever. That's the kind of king Jesus is. Now you need to let that sink in for a minute. Just think about it. What have you ever read in history of a king who fought and died for his soldiers and for his people? It never, it's never happened. It's the soldiers that go out and fight and die for the king, right? When in United States history has a president ever declare war and then step down and join the military to fight and die uh, for his country, for his people? It hasn't ever happened. It never has. Folks, but King Jesus, your king, my king, he fought and died to conquer the consequences of our sin. Jesus expounds on this a little later. Let's look at that in verse 31 and 32. He says, now the time has come for judgment on this world. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. 
There's two things that you need to know that Jesus' death accomplished right there. First of all, Jesus' death conquered Satan. Broke his grip on this world. Broke his grip on us. Okay? That's true. Jesus' death was also a statement. And actually, the, the actual outpouring of God's judgment on this world. Okay? What does that mean? It does, it's not a good thing, is what, it, is what it is. It means that God looked at our world, us, our sin against Him and against one another, and this, this world, this, this thing we've created, and, and, he, and His judgment was the cross. He said, that's worth, that, that, that deserves the cross. They deserve the cross. Jesus' death was, 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 was the payment, right? The beatings that, that he endured, the, the mocking, the crown of thorns on his head, the nails in his hands and his feet, the spear in his side, the abandonment by God, right? The abandonment by God. That was God's judgment, his, his evaluation on this world, on us. And see, this is a stumbling block. This is a little bit harder to accept than King Jesus, isn't it? Than, than King Jesus who blesses. Right? This is King Jesus who says, you have sinned and sinned grievously. And, 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 and this, is, this is not anything light. This is not anything to be played. This is, this is, this is bad, bad news. And folks, this, this, that, that hurdle keeps many of us away from accepting King Jesus, the one who died for us. Folks, because that's the good news, right? That, that, that King Jesus died for us so that we might live with God, right? And that was motivated by God's love, right? Greater love has no one in this that he what? That he lay down his life for his brothers. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ, King Jesus, laid down his life for us so that we might live. Well, that's the good side of that, isn't it? Yeah. Our King Jesus, the King who died for you, for me, to give us life now and forever with God. Jesus paid the debt, folks, that we could not pay. You know, when I was in high school, I... Probably some of you did this. I wrecked the car. You ever have an accident when you're in high school and wrecked the car? Yeah. Boy, well, what a... You know, what a cliche, right? Oh, the teenager wrecks the car, right? And it was careless, reckless. It was my fault, no doubt about it. Okay? You know what? I couldn't pay that bill. The damage was too great and the bill was too high. Okay? My parents paid that bill to repair the damage. Because I couldn't afford it. What the cross tells us, folks, is that the damage that we've done with our sin is too great. And the cost is too high for us to pay. But because God loves us, because King Jesus loves you, He paid to repair the damage of our relationship with God. King Jesus, right? Amen, God. Jesus is King. 
That's, that doesn't stop there, though. I want you to, I want you to know that, that Jesus is, is, is there's, he's also uh, a, another kind of king. Oh, he's the king that blesses, right? He, Jesus does not hold back everything that God has to give he wants or has already given you. He wants to give you. He is the king who died for you to pay the penalty for your sin because he loves you so that you don't have to, so that you can be united with God forever. But Jesus is another kind of king also. Jesus is the king who calls us to die to ourselves and live for him. Jesus is the king who calls us to die. In response to that, in response to the fact that he is the king who blesses, that he is the king who died, he calls us in response to die to ourselves and live for him. Let's look at that. Verse 25, Jesus continues. He says, the man who, who, who loves his life, he's going to lose it. While the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now let me just stop right there and explain. This is a common way of comparison that Hebrew teachers used, okay? Hate, love. Love, hate as a comparison, all right? Jesus isn't saying you've got to hate your wife and hate your family and hate yourself and hate your car. That's not what he's saying, okay? What he's saying is, is that, listen, if, if you're all caught up in this world, if this is what your life is about, you know, what I can get, what I can achieve, what I can bank, what I can wear, what I can drive, what I can build, right? We've heard this, Jesus say these things in different ways throughout the, throughout the Gospels, right? That's, and, and, you, and, you, and, you, and you give nothing, your life is not about the, the, the kingdom, the next world, right? Jesus is talking about living in light of eternity. Which, which world, which, which time do you live for? Where are your values? Where's your heart? Where's your passion? Is it here and now, or is it in the kingdom? Right? I mean, that's what he said. Could say it in many, many different ways, right? Uh, uh, don't, you know, don't store up treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal, right? What should it profit a man if he gained the whole world and, let, and yet lose his soul, right? Uh, so will it be with anyone who is rich in this world, but not rich towards God. All these, these are, Jesus said these things in many different ways. So Jesus says, that's what he's talking about. You know, what are you really living for? Of course, we, God, God gives us talents and abilities to use, and he wants us to go to work, and, and it's good to earn a living, and there's nothing wrong with earning a good living. Okay, I'm not saying any of that. All right? But he's talking about purpose. He's talking about that thing that drives us. The thing we're living for. You know? That's what he's talking about. Verse 26. Whoever serves me must follow me. So Jesus is asking us to do for him in at least a a, a, a non-literal way what he did for us literally, right? He laid down his life for us that we might live. He's asking us to lay down our lives to live for him. To live for him. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Jesus is this kind of king also. Jesus is also the king that says, I want you to live for me. I want you to lay all that stuff down, okay, and live for me. Live for my kingdom. Serve my kingdom. Bled, live for, for me and others, right? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you, or as Jesus has promised, right? Now look, I want you to notice that this is not, we're not talking about a, we're, Jesus is not saying, hey, man, you got to just become a poor beggar, you know, on the street. He says, what happens when we do that? My Father will honor the one who serves me, right? By laying down our lives, 
uh, by, by, by denying ourselves and, and living for Jesus, man, we get King Jesus the blesser. The more you give to Jesus, the more he will bless you. If you have trouble, you know, some people struggle with, am I forgiven? Does God really love me? Are my sins really paid for? If you, if you follow King Jesus this way, uh, he will bless you with certainty about your relationship with him. So even when Jesus calls us to die to ourselves and live for him, it, he's, it still results in blessing. It still results in encouragement. A little bit harder to follow, to accept that King Jesus, isn't it? And that's the, that was really the crowd's problem. Man, they wanted King Jesus, the King who blesses. And we want King Jesus who blesses. And Jesus does bless. Make no mistake about that. We want King Jesus who died for us, don't we? If we can come to the point where we can humble ourselves and say, I'm a sinner and I need your grace, when we realize that, amen, right? And we need to want, we ought to want, we ought to worship Jesus by giving our lives back to him, right? I mean, that's worship, right? That's praise, that's honor that he is due. Jesus' greatest desire for you today is to trust him. As king. Let's look at that in verse 32. But when I am lifted up from the earth, Jesus said, I will draw all men, all women, all people to myself. He said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. So Jesus says, listen, if I, they understood, if I am lifted up from the earth, they understood that meant crucifixion, okay? If I do that, Jesus says, I will draw all men and women to me. There is nothing more than, than that Jesus wants than for you to trust him. Then Jesus told them, put your trust in the light. Jesus is the light of the world, right? Put your trust in the light while you have it so that you may become children of light. There is nothing more. As a matter of fact, it is God's plan. It is the reason why Jesus died and rose again, that you would trust him as your king. That you would, that you would go to him as the one who, who, who suffered the judgment for your sins and, and say, Lord, thank you. That you would trust him as the one who wants to bless you. I know sometimes it doesn't seem that way, does it? Sometimes life gets difficult. Sometimes God waits. Sometimes he allows us to develop character before he blesses us. Okay? He wants nothing more than for you to lay down your life and, and live for him so that he can, he can, he can be your king and, and, and pour his blessing out. So before we celebrate the Lord's Supper, a couple of questions for you to ponder and pray about. Uh, before you get up and, and, and uh, take the bread and the cup. Is Jesus your king? Have you, have you trusted? Do you know? Have you gone to Jesus and said, Jesus, I believe, I trust you, that you are the king who wants to bless me. Man, so many people think God wants to rob them and steal and take away. God wants to bless you. <coughs> Have you gone to Jesus as the king who died for you to pay the penalty for your sin? Have you gone to Jesus? Have you responded to him and said, Jesus, I, I lay down my life because of who you are and what you've done for me. I want to live for you. Okay? I don't know the answers to those questions. Only you know them for you. Only I know them for me. So let's take a few moments in prayer before we celebrate the Lord's Supper, okay? When you're ready, uh, just make your way up, uh, take the bread and the cup, and there's a wastebasket at either table, and you can drop your cup in there, okay? Let's pray.